Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do most Sundays of the month. The first Sunday of every month is a subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in photos of things in their yard that they're proud of. That video is next Sunday. If you're interested in participating, you can send photos to this email address and uh, just title the uh, uh, email subscriber photos or something like that. I get a lot of email to that email address and uh, uh, it's the best way for me to uh, find your photos to include in that video. If you have gardening questions, you can ask them down below this video and two weeks from now, I'll have another question and answer video. What else? Uh, I've been, we've been doing the giveaway for the, um, uh, for the uh, SNPs. Uh, the first four winners, um, I sent yours out this past week. So if you haven't gotten them already, you will soon. And the winners from this past week on YouTube was John Crunk. And on Instagram was Landerson260. Uh, if you'll send me an email to that same email address, I will uh, get those out to you with your, with your address. Uh, there won't, uh, that's the last of the um, Corona Snips giveaways for now. Uh, this next week, I'll have a uh, plantsbymail.com giveaway um, that's coming soon. I'm sure um, everyone's going to be interested in free plants since the spring is coming. So don't forget to subscribe to this channel to make sure you see when that video goes up because um, there'll be a, a, a good chance to win free plants. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, so the first video went up on my new YouTube channel with Bree Arthur. It's called No Rules Gardening. For those of you who have not, who I don't know this yet, um, and there's a an, there's a No Rules Gardening Instagram, Facebook, NoRulesGardening.com, and on the uh, website we're doing a blog post for every video that goes up on that channel. So if you're watching a video and we're talking about plants and we're going too fast or whatever. There's actually a blog post uh, that goes with it. So there's a written piece for all the videos. That should be pretty uh, interesting, I hope. Um, it's our first video. It won't be our, um, it's a good video, I think, but it won't be our best, probably. Um, uh, it's the Shade Plant Tour over here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. The Sun Tour is coming soon, and we've already shot three other videos as well. So those will go up um, over time. These pieces on that channel will be a little bit meatier. They're going to be tours of big Guard, uh, botanical gardens and arboretums and uh, friends of ours uh, gardens and hopefully some of the biggest uh, ho hopefully some of the uh, uh, we'll be we're interviewing um, experts in, in in the field of horticulture across the country um, whether they're growing plants or whether they're you know um, tending to them in an arboretum uh, that kind of thing so sh hopefully hopefully an interesting channel so uh, go subscribe if you would thank you uh, all right so let's get to the questions. Uh, from last week, somebody asked why are grow um, why are potatoes why they see so many people growing potatoes in grow bags, and the reason for it, that I did it last year was actually because they store so easily. You know, it takes pretty big pots to grow um, potatoes in, um, and the reason we're growing potatoes above ground here in my area is because there's well, we have clay based soils. Uh, they don't do uh, all that well. You can grow potatoes in it, but um, a little east and south of here, uh, the soil's very different. It's a little easier to grow them, and my yard wouldn't be. So I'm growing above the ground. It's just easier. And then the grow bags allow me to just use them, empty them out, clean them off a little bit, and then fold them up and put them away. So that's the reason I'm using them. They actually do dry out a little more. They actually require a little more maintenance, honestly, but um, I do like growing in them because they store uh, easily. And then they ask me what size is best, and I think 15 gallon at a minimum. Um, 15 gallon or 25 gallon. I've got a video coming up from last year where I used 10 gallon ones and they're a little bit too small. I think it reduced my yield a little bit. I got a lot of potatoes, but I think it did reduce my yield a little bit. It's just what I had on hand at the time. 15 or 25 gallon grow bags and they store easily. Um, somebody asked me the best time to divide perennials. I guess perennials that go completely dormant. I actually, hardy things, I actually like to do in the fall as they've gotten slammed from cold but they haven't but i can still see them they're a little hard to find unfortunately in january and february or i guess when they're first emerging uh in the spring when they're kind of still dormant but you can still see them uh fall or spring if it's a marginal plant i'm probably not going to divide it in the fall or winter i'll probably wait until early spring like if i you know have a salvia that's barely hardy in my area and it's got a little colony that i want to divide uh, i probably do that in the spring but otherwise uh, any time uh, during the uh, fall or uh, winter. It's fine that you can find them and see them. Cut them with a shovel, put them back in the ground. Don't worry about it. Uh, stress should be low stress event. Uh, somebody said they, they tested their pH and it's between 5.4 and 5.8, which is a, 
acid, but not crazy, uh, but crazy low. Uh, and they wanted to um, uh, know about uh, wh whether they should lime. Um, and uh, I probably wouldn't. At 5.8, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, if you're growing a wide variety of things, I've got a video on my channel called Why pH is So Important. And I show where 6.5 is kind of the ideal pH if you just want to plant one of everything. Um, you know, that's the spot where the nutrients are most available. Mo the majority of nutrients are at least slightly available around 6.5. And so plants may not thrive in it necessarily, but it's, it's a spot where you can grow the most variety of things. 5.8 isn't that far off, far enough off of that that I'm going to start um, stressing about it. I think you're going to be fine. Just you know, plant everything you see on my channel that I've probably ever shown planting on my channel at the old house or this house or anything that I showed at my garden center or my nursery, 5.8 is going to be perfect for. Your vegetables, um, I'm probably going to add some compost. Compost would bring that, um, would raise that up. I'm probably going to grow in a 50% compost and soil mix or something like that or in a raised bed uh, just to get that a little closer to neutral for my vegetables, which is what I do here. You know, I'm, I'm adding compost, you know, once a year over here to the vegetable garden for sure, just to keep that, um, keep that up a little, you know, keep the uh, uh, pH up a little bit. Uh, but that's it. I mean, 5.8, I'm just not going to stress about it. Just, just get to work planting. Uh, let's see, uh, what is the best way to store fresh mulch in the winter? Uh, I'm guessing if you, if, I guess, I think they had some stuff ground up and wanted to know how to store store it through the winter time. Low piles, I think is important. I mean, if you pile something up eight or 10 feet high, it'll start to compost and it'll get hot. And uh, it'll still look like mulch on the outside, but it'll turn to compost in the middle pretty quick. Uh, even in the winter, you know, it can uh, pile, a tall pile of organic material get hot in a hurry. So uh, just in low piles, it uh, doesn't matter. I wouldn't worry about putting anything over it. Just keep it from composting. Um, or, so you'll still have it in the spring. Otherwise, it'll go away quick. And then it's compost, and you can use it as compost. Uh, but um, uh, just low, small piles so it doesn't heat up. Somebody bought two uh, Thuja um, Arborvita from uh, Lowe's, and uh, one of them is slightly crushed. And I uh, wanted to know if they should go ahead and try to reshape it a little bit. Um, if something is already stressed like that, I'm probably going to just leave. I'm probably going to plant it, leave it be, wait for it to put on some new growth in the spring, uh, and then maybe give it a haircut at that point once I see how it's going to try to fill back in on its own. Uh, I talk about this a lot. Just don't double stress things. Um, that peach, um, had a, I was saving that peach tree in a video the other day. And uh, it was planted too deep a long time ago. The roots had actually gotten smaller on it and I didn't want to take it out of the ground and move it to a better location. Uh, I put it in a container to, to kind of try to get it to root back out before I move it. So I don't want to, I don't like to double stress things, uh, if that makes any sense. And so if you've already got something with stress on it, walk away from it, you know, water it when it needs water and just kind of let it recover a little bit on its own before you start stressing it again. That would be my recommendation. Uh, let's see. Um, Oh, somebody uh, over in Winston-Salem, which is maybe an hour and 15, 20 minutes west of me, they got some green giant arborvita and they're bronzing. Uh, that's normal for green giant arborvita to turn a bronze color in the wintertime. She said some are bronze and some aren't, and they're fairly newly planted. And so I imagine the ones that are more bronze had s either more stress or less fertilizer or there was some difference in, you know, um, maybe the field they were dug out of or whatever, uh, they'll be equal next year. Whatever they're gonna be, they'll be equal next year, green or bronze. It's been a kind of a mild winter, so I don't see them bronzing as much as they can. Uh, but in a, uh, in a colder winter, and by the way, it's 20 degrees while I'm shooting this, my hand's cold. Uh, but in a winter where it's gonna get down in the teens and that kind of thing in our area, it's gonna, they're gonna bronze uh, during the winter time. It's not an actual issue. And the only reason it's weird because some are and some aren't is because they're newly planted. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, so, okay, so, um, you know, I talked about people over fertilizing uh, in last week's uh, video, and then they said, well, you know, the fertilizer instructions always say to do it frequently. Well, that's a fertilizer company trying to sell you fertilizer. <laughs> They're going to tell you to do it uh, as, you know, very, very often. Um, but for me, you'll see when I get back from this trip, I'm going to fertilize everything in this yard with a slow release, uh, with a uh, organic fertilizer. And then I'm going to be done for the entire season, and that's going to be it. Um, and, and you'll see, hopefully you'll see during the season, you know, and, and if you follow my channel last year, you saw how lush everything was out here. 
and it is the result of a little bit of compost, uh, two times mulching, and uh, one time last year, a light half rate fertilization, not a double rate, but a half rate uh, fertilization. And, you know, everything was lush and great. Of course, uh, this morning, everything's a little tough because it's cold, but uh, trust me, we are all over fertilizing. Just keep the ground covered with organic material and your plants will be happy. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked me the best time to plant or to propagate blueberries. I think I, I cover this all the time, but that, um, that May 15th to July 31st window is probably the best time to, uh, uh, to propagate blueberries. They root readily uh, in a window where the new growth is hardened off slightly, but it's not woody. Uh, and I, you know, I, think I've said, I think I've said this a lot, and it's going to be true for pretty much every plant. Um, it's just an easy period of time to root things. You can root hardwood cuttings of blueberries. They don't root that easily. Uh, you'll get much lower percentages uh, than you will just waiting until June 1st. Uh, and, and, and almost any technique in June 1st will work to root some. To, you'll get some rooted for sure. Okay, let's see. Um, we'll, okay, so I talked about my cool season vegetables going in February 15th. So you'll see that as soon as I get back. Um, the last two nights have been so cold that all my broccoli, every, everything over there is looking tough now. So I'm going to replant that garden February 15th. I don't just go out on February 15th and plant it. I'll look at the 10 day forecast. And if there's something in like the low twenties or something like that, like it is this morning, I'm not planting it. I'm going to wait to after that. But if I see that it's just going to be like 32, 30 in there, I'm not going to worry about it at all. I'm going to put them in the ground. I have a frost protection blanket, so I'll try to keep the frost off of them, but uh, you can get a frost protection blanket from uh, Amazon to have on hand. It's actually in use right now over some pots back here. Uh, and uh, I'll use it uh, on my cool season vegetables that go in the ground on nights where it's below freezing. Um, they'll take the temperatures below freezing. I just want to actually keep the actual frost off of them. Okay. Um, somebody asked me, uh, oh, they, they have their seed starting rack in the garage and wanted to know whether they should put some sort of plastic around it to actually um, heat uh, inside of it. And it would depend on what you're rooting so, or, um, or what you're seeding. So my cool season vegetables like broccoli and uh, uh, other things, you, can, you don't really need the heat uh, to, uh, to, to, get them, to get them seeded out. So the stuff you're doing right now, you're probably fine on a seed starting rack in a garage without additional heat. I mean, I know you are, 100%. When you get around to starting your peppers and tomatoes, tomatoes don't like temperatures below even 50. They, they just flat out won't germinate. So if it's a cold period of time in March uh, when you're starting your tomato seeds, um, it should be warm in your garage. It shouldn't be that cold. But if it's consistently in there, you know, in the 30s at night, um, I, I think you're gonna get poor results from your tomatoes. And they have nutrient deficiency issues on cold nights. Uh, they get weird, uh, weird, issues where the leaves will turn purple and that kind of thing when they're uh when they get to, when they get cold on them um it's actual nutrient deficiency issues related to cold roots uh, so when you start your warm season vegetables if your garage isn't warm enough you're going to need to make sure that it's over 50 degrees in there uh, but your cool season vegetables you'll be fine so another long answer from jim okay so uh, let's see one more here um Somebody asked me about the best year-round containers uh, to use. Uh, I use, I have concrete uh, containers out here and fiber concrete containers out here. They'll hold up to the frost and freezes. Uh, I don't like to use terracotta. There is a terracotta pot behind me, but it's a big, super heavy duty one. The thinner terracotta, you know, when the, when the water in the pots freeze, it expands. You, you guys know this, and, and it can crack pots pretty easily. So thin terracotta pots will crack. Uh, on a 20 degree morning like this, if there's enough water in that pot, uh, that thicker one's going to be fine. And then the concrete pots. And then I don't, I like to use pots that have a little bit of shape like this to them. Okay. Which is normal. Most pots are, I don't like to use like barrel shaped pots, um, because the soil is impossible to get out. If you root something into one of those barrels, um, when you go to empty it, uh, afterwards with a narrower collar on the, uh, pot on the container. Uh, it's nearly impossible to get anything out of them. Oh, it's not impossible, but you got to work really hard. So um, for the reason of freezing, um, because it allows the soil to expand upward and uh, for ease of replanting and repotting, I don't want anything that has a narrower collar on it. 
but concrete and really those of you who you know maybe older or whatever you know all those new concrete um, fiberglass pots which i have lots of them out here they look super heavy and industrial and they're kind of light because they're made out of cement and uh and uh, fiberglass and that's another thing on monday i'm going to michael carr's place in atlanta and touring his uh, containers he's the person who sent me all the containers last year he actually um, makes the aquapots uh, if you guys are interested in a video from michael carr's place in atlanta um, let me know he's one of the biggest distributors of um, of containers uh, in the country it was weird that just tied in and then I remembered I'm gonna actually be there on Monday If you guys are interested in a video from his place uh, let me know and I'll, and I'll shoot one uh, while I'm there he has a, a ton a ton of different uh, containers and uh, at his place so uh, again thank you guys for watching following along ask questions down below for two weeks from now and uh, again uh, make sure you're subscribed to the channel because sometime this week when I make it over to South Alabama I'll announce a plantsbymail.com uh, giveaway and a video from their place. Thanks for watching.